See, look at you listen a little better. You misquoted Philippians 2 because you read it out of context. You started at 9. Why would you start at 9 when it begins at 5? Okay. Why would you misread a passage? Well, I, wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to read that one. It's okay. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to help you. Levi, don't get defensive, dude. I'm trying to help you how to read the Bible. Okay. You I'll read go to Philippians 9 where it says, therefore, let me tell you what you read, but you read it out of context. The therefore tells you that something preceded it, right? It says, therefore, yeah. God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. But that's because... Of what came before, if you read from Philippians 2, 5 to 8, it says, Let this mind be yours as it was Christ Jesus, who, though existing in the form of God, or you can say nature God, did not consider equality God with something to exploit, take advantage of, but made himself of no reputation by taking on the form of a slave and being found in human likeness, born in human likeness, right? Humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. So why would I read that out of context when the first part says Christ willfully, voluntarily made him a, made himself a slave to die? So then what's the father's response to what the son did? Exalt him. So why is that a problem? Well, I, I don't really think it is. I'm just what I'll go at that person with is I'll say, OK, how do I reconcile why would you need First to reconcile thing. it when God is responding to Jesus humbling himself before the Father? So if I humbled myself before my Father, and then my Father in gratitude because of me humbling myself, exalts me to become co-owner of the company, does that mean I'm less than my Father in nature and value and dignity? No. So no. what's the problem if we understand the Trinity? So what I'm trying to say is, that is the father's response to the son humbling himself to die a pitiful, excruciating, shameful death, the death of a slave. So what is the father's response? Son, because you humbled yourself before me, though you are my equal, because that's what it says in Philippians 2. If you read it 5 to 8 and you read 6 carefully, it says, who, because he's existing in the form of God. And the word morphe, theu, can mean the nature of God did not consider equality with God something to take advantage of or to exploit, but made himself nothing. He, Jesus, voluntarily made himself nothing by taking on the form of a slave. So if I were to ask you, if Jesus is in the form of the slave, does that mean he's a slave? If I have the form of a slave, what does that make me? Well, that makes you a woman servant, doesn't it? Yeah. So if I'm in the form of God, what does that make me? What, you? In the form of God, what does that make me? I don't have an answer to that. You got to answer it because it's common sense. You just said, if I'm in the form of a slave, that makes me a slave. Okay, then you're God. Right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, so no, and I don't want you to say, I want you to see the logic of the text. He's in the form of God, and then he took the form of a slave. If logic demands that if he's in the form of a slave, that makes him a slave, then being in the form of God makes him what? God. So why would I then misread Philippians 2 by starting at 9 when Paul already told me Jesus is God in nature who humbled himself to become a slave in nature by becoming human? Because you're either a human servant of God or an angelic servant of God. So Jesus chose to become a human servant by becoming human. He became a servant to the Father, even though by nature he's God. And he did it voluntarily. So now God responds to that act of humiliation by exalting him to the highest position. So he goes from being a slave to now reigning as king over creation. This is the father's response to the son humbling himself. And Jesus is fulfilling his own words. Because what did he say in Matthew 23, 12? Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Exalt yourself and you'll be humbled. Okay. So what did who humbled himself and God the Father exalts him. As an example for us, imitate me. Humble yourselves before one another. Serve one another. Consider one another more highly than yourself. And if you do that, you'll be exalted. And the supreme example is me, Jesus. I humbled myself before my Father to the point I became a man, a human slave, and died a human death. And he exalted me in response to my willful act of humility, likewise, if you do this, you'll be exalted too. That's the entire point of Philippians 2. Because in verses 1 
to 5, he's talking about how we should view one another. Last time I checked, all believers in Christ are fully human, and there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, neither free nor slave. We're all one in Christ Jesus. But Paul is saying, though you're all one, and you have the same value and dignity before God, treat your brother, sister, more highly than yourself, and humble yourself before your brother and sister, and God will exalt you. So in that context, he's talking to Christians who have equal value and worth in the eyes of God, but don't take advantage of it. Don't exploit it. Humble yourself before your brother, before your sister, like Jesus humbled himself before the Father. Mm -hmm. It's not hard about Philippians 2. Okay. Then how do you interpret... Um, say again? I didn't What's hear you. Philippians 2. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, no, there's nothing wrong. Scripture, uh, I'm sorry, Scripture does not contradict Scripture. So how would you interpret 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28 then? Yeah, that's easy now. Now, so we're off of Philippians 2 now, right? Yes. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, what's the context again? The context is in 24 to 28, Jesus Christ will rule until he destroys all his enemies and bring them under his foot, feet, and the last enemy is death, right? Yes. And then it says the son will subject himself to God so that God will be all in all. The assumption is that God being all in all does not include Jesus. It excludes Jesus. Why would you assume that? I'm not assuming that. I'm saying no, I'm it looks to me God. like he is uh, under the father's authority. No, it says, well, read, it, read it carefully, but I understand. It says the son <laughs> will subject himself. It's in the middle passive voice. I'm sorry. It's the middle voice. to the So that God will be. In other words, when Jesus submits himself to God. It's not for the purpose of him being subordinated. It's for the purpose of him coming in union with the Father so that he with the Father will be the God who's all in all. Because from the moment when Jesus subjects himself to God, everything will be fully reconciled to God and God will be fully reconciled with all creation. There'll be no more opposition, no more enemy, no more death perfectly reconciled creation to god but the god who's all in all includes jesus he's part mm -hmm. of the identity of the god who's all in all how do i know okay. because the same paul tells me that in the age to come when death is abolished christ will still reign over all things and in revelation 22 i'm told that after death is destroyed and there's a new heaven new earth the throne of god and the lamb will be in the city revelation 22 verses 1 to 5. So when does Jesus cease to reign with the Father? Never. Never, yeah. So the assumption is that if the Son now subjects himself to the Father, it's for the purpose of being beneath the Father and that the Father alone is the God who's all in all. No, that's the opposite point. He's now destroying all opposition, and then he comes under the Father to now begin reigning with the Father as the God who's all in all. That's Revelation 22, 1 to 3. In the age to come when death is destroyed, it says the throne, one, of God and the Lamb will be in the city. Revelation 22, verse 1 to 3. And then if I open up Ephesians 1, let me read to you what it says here. Remember, the age to come when death is destroyed, same Paul. I don't think Paul contradicts himself, and I don't think you think he does that. We're not liberals. So Ephesians 1, 19 and 23. How long does Jesus reign above every created thing? Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Ephesians 1, 19 and 23. Now, these are good questions on the Trinity. This was open for. Now, watch here. On the screen, St. Paul, who doesn't contradict himself. I believe he's consistent. I'm not a liberal who thinks that Paul is all over the map. Ephesians 1, 19 and 23. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us? God's power that he uses in our favor for our benefit, according to the working of the might of his strength which he worked in Christ. And he showed us his power, how glorious his power is. How? By raising Christ immortal. That's power that is beyond comprehension. And that's the power he's using on our behalf in our favor to glorify us. By raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in heavenly places. Now watch. How long will Christ rule above every creature? Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name, that is named not only in this age, but also in the, the one to come. So when does Jesus cease to be far supreme over all creation? Never. 
Thank you. So 1 Corinthians 15, 28 must include Jesus as the God who's all in all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if he's the God who's all in all, that means he cannot be inferior to the Father in essence because he must be equal to the Father and the Spirit to be the God who reigns supreme over all creation forever. He's part of the identity of that God who's all in all, right? Right. And let me finish this because I'm going to give you a supporting passage for that. So, in the age to come, and he put all things in subjection under Jesus' feet and gave him, Jesus, to be head supreme over all things for the sake of the church, which is his body, his spiritual body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now watch. Watch the phrase 1 Corinthians 15, 28 with Colossians 3, 11. 1 Corinthians 15, 28 and Colossians 3, 11. Watch here. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. This is what you're referring to. Here's what he's referring to, but I'm going to show you that the part, last part includes Jesus. And when all things are subjected, subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected, literally will subject himself to the one who subjected all things to him so that God... May be all in all. Now that phrase, God may be all in all, I just proved has to include Jesus. Now here's the proof. Colossians 3.11. St. Paul says that already for believers who are united to God, not in opposition to him, Christ is already all to everyone. Here it is. Colossians 3.11. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, because Christ is all and in all. Yeah. Same language, right? Right, yeah. Now, what's his point? Let me explain his point. We who are believers are reconciled to God and not in opposition. So therefore, Christ is already all in and all. He's in union with us, in fellowship with us, and we're in fellowship with him. But that will happen... For every created thing, when Christ destroys all opposition, all enemy, and death, and the only things that will exist on earth are those believers who are now fully reconciled to God and a creation that's no longer disordered and influenced by demonic powers, but a fully restored creation. So there will be perfect union, fellowship, and peace between God and creation. That's what it means for God to be all in all. But that includes Christ. And we got a taste of it already now in the church. In the church, God is already all in all and will be fully realized at the end. But that includes Christ as being the God who's all in all, right? Right. Okay. Let me make one more point no, I... for you. Just one more point for you to ask. You see where it says okay. Christ will be subjected to God, the Father? Yeah. That same word, subjected, hupotasso. You can look at a Greek lexicon so you know I'm not lying. Luke 2.51. That same word, Luke 2.51, applied to Jesus when he was around 12 years old. And look what it says, Luke 2.51. Okay. Okay. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. Same word. Now, it says that Jesus was subjected to Mary and Joseph. Does that mean Jesus is inferior to Mary and Joseph in essence and nature and worth? No, no. But it's the same word. He was subjected to them, meaning Mary and Joseph. Same word, right? Right. Yeah, so you know the Greek better than I do. So I, why would we assume that if Jesus is subject to the Father, it makes him less divine, a second God, or inferior in essence to the Father, when we don't assume that when Jesus is subject to Mary and Joseph? Who in their right mind would say, that Jesus being subject to Mary and Joseph makes him less human, inferior in essence and value. Only. So you have, so far with me? No, no, I'm with you. I have no problem with it. It's just when I used to get asked, I don't YouTube anymore. I just go on other people's panels now. I'm just another question I was asked about a long time ago. And uh, like even before Yeshua came down, because I believe he always was. Eternal Father yeah, equals like Eternal Son. Eternal Father, though. I know that. But take yeah. it well, eternal, eternal Father, father equals... Uh, Eternal Son, right? Yeah, practically speaking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But one thing I want it's to know: just, Why are you calling him Yeshua? Do you have a problem calling him Jesus? No, I, I'm not a sacred namer. I am a Jewish believer in the Messiah Yeshua. Yeah, but you said Yeshua again. Why don't you like to say Jesus? I think you want me to say Jesus. 
No problem. Now, the reason why I say that is because people, when they say Yeshua, all right. Now, how certain are you? I'm just asking for you to start thinking because you look like you want to go deep. How certain are you that Jesus was called Yeshua, not Yehoshua? I'm not. There's, there's debates on that all day. It's exactly. just. But we do have absolute proof that he's called Jesus because it comes from Isus. New Testament written in Greek says Isus. So when people say Yeshua, I'm not saying that they're sinning. That's not a sin unless they make it an issue of trying to become Hebrew Israelites and to the extent. Well, point I, being, I used I used to have to deal with these sacred namers. I call them stickler namers, and they really don't understand what they're doing. So I'll, okay. it's not like I'm, okay, I'm not so guilty. What's the other questions that. you have on the Trinity, brother? Because we have a few more people waiting. Well, I, it's just okay no problem last question it's just that i have looked into this too and i'm looking at john no this is before you jesus came down in the flesh uh, when he tabernacled with us so i'm looking at john 10 18 no man taketh it from me but i lay it down on myself i have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again this commandment have i received in my father this looks to me like a direct order it wasn't a suggestion sure. much less a request it was it was yeah. an order a command Right. Uh, of course. Well, that's the thing. If Mary commands Jesus to go to the store and buy groceries, does that mean Jesus is less human than Mary and she's better than him? Well, obviously not. No. So again, the yeah. assumption seems to be that if the father tells the son what to do, then somehow that means the son is not equal to the father in essence, nature, glory, and value. That's erroneous. That's okay. not the, the meaning. The meaning is... The Father commands, the Son accomplishes by the Spirit, because within the Godhead, there's perfect, inseparable union. There are no arguments, no debates. The Father's will is the Son's will, the Spirit's will. They're inseparable. They're unchangeable. They are of the same mind and do all things together perfectly. And so Jesus is simply affirming that he came to lay down his life in obedience to the Father's will, that it would be the Son to redeem us. Since he's not the Son, this poses no problem for the Trinity. That's what I'm trying to say. If it's one person, not three persons, then we'd have a problem. But I'm not a modalist. I'm a Trinitarian for this very reason. Father is not the Son. Son is not the Spirit. Spirit's not the Father. The Father sends the Son and the Spirit to carry out his perfect will because his will is the Son's will, the Spirit's will. But likewise, the Father and Son send the Spirit, John 16, 12 to 13. There Jesus says that when the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you all truth. He will not speak on his own initiative. He'll only speak what he hears. Because the Spirit does not do his own thing. He only does what the Father and Son send him to do. And that's all they can do because they're perfect and inseparable. And there is no debate and division. Right. And that, but to me, that also, as well as what you're saying, it also it? sounds like a sign. It also signs... Uh, it also sounds like a sign of submission by the Spirit, the rock, right? How would the Son be the perfect Son if he's insubordinate to the Father? That's why right. he's called the Son for a reason. So if he's the Son, then he's the Son of someone. And if he's the perfect Son, can he ever be insubordinate to what the Father wants? Right. No, the, the point is made. I just. Yeah, that's what know, I'm it saying. It seems so, like a, a hierarchy to me, you know. Well, it, it, even if you say hierarchy, it depends on what you mean by hierarchy. If you're saying that the Father is the head of the Son and the Spirit, well, obviously, if he's the Father, being the Father gives him a status. But that doesn't imply that the Son and Spirit are inferior to the Father. Because just like you can be the head of your son, but your son be smarter than you, healthier than you, better than you, and make more money than you. When I say better, in meaning health-wise. So yeah. being the head of someone does not imply that the one who's subject is inferior. Inferior how? Just like using human analogy, because human analogy helps us to understand God, who's infinitely more complex. You may have a son. I don't know if you do. He can be healthier than you, stronger than you, more intelligent than you, make more money than you. Is that going to change the fact that you're his head? No. So just because the father can send the son and command him, and the son perfectly obeys, this says nothing about them being equal in nature, essence, and glory, and value, especially when Jesus himself says, the Father glorifies me and demands everyone to glorify me. 
And the son in John 17, verses 1 to 2 and 5, himself makes a command. He says, now, Father, glorify me. That's the command as well. Glorify okay. the son, that the son may glorify you. And John 17, 5, now, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. That sounds like a command, which it is. Yes. Yep. Well, exactly mm -hmm. what it's called, the monarchy. Mm -hmm. Monarchy. Okay. okay. You see the point? Yeah, no, no. This has been very uh, productive and helpful. I just, um, you know what, you've explained it better than anybody else I've talked to. So, because well, I, do, I don't want to give somebody false information saying something wrong and that's lead no, them. Amen for you, brother. Thank the Lord that you have a humble heart teachable. And I thank Jesus for what you said. I explained it better than anyone else you've heard thus far, but I'm not the best. But keep in mind, the problem is not with what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. It's our misunderstanding of what the Trinity is. But you're learning. Glory to God. Come back with more questions. Maybe I'll be on tomorrow. All right. All right. Have a good night. God bless you, brother.